And hello, everybody. Welcome back this time. Yes, it is week seven already. Can you believe it? Stakeholder management. This is frankly one of the most important lessons we'll have. Heck, they're all important, but mm, this one is pretty darn important. Okay, so let's kick into it. So one of the stakeholders that you will always need to be concerned with sometimes goes by the title a sponsor. A sponsor really is an executive level leader who probably owns part of the budget, right? And so they have some authority, responsibility, and you want to develop the relationships. I call that R cubed is my term for them, R cubed, roles, responsibilities, and relationships. And I will put that right here, okay? Uh, but a good way to begin sponsor management is to really just have an initial face-to-face -face meeting with your boss or your boss's boss, whatever level they are. During that meeting, uh, there are several things you want to come to an agreement on. For example, what is going to be your role as a manager that transforms? It, what are your roles and responsibilities based on their way of thinking, right? Are there limits to your authority in this role? What about how can they sponsor themselves help you? What is their set of roles and responsibilities. Frankly, uh, one of the questions I like to ask is how do they like to be communicated with? What are their preferences? When, another way to say this is when do they make their best decisions? Because if I put a decision in front of them, I want their the power, their full faculties applied to it, and hopefully a decision in my favor. So do they like emails? Do they like face-to-face? -face? Do they like a PowerPoint? Do they like attachments? Do they like briefings? Do they like it in the morning? Uh, would they prefer a presentation for a decision in the afternoon, in the evening? Maybe some go home at night and when they get away from the crowd uh, because they spend a lot of their day walking around and listening to the people themselves, that some go home and make their decisions then. Also, what's their communication frequency? How often you do not want to bog them down. You can become like spam to them, right? And then it's not effective. So how often do you want uh, them to communicate with you? Um, what is the risk utility, right? Um, is your sponsor, your senior leader, your executive, your key decision maker is another way to say it. Are they risk seeking or are they risk neutral or are they risk averse? It's very important as a manager to understand your own risk appetite, risk threshold uh, and risk tolerance as well as other key leaders in the company like your sponsor. Get to know their risk appetite, risk tolerance, and risk threshold. In fact, even your company as a culture will have a risk appetite, a risk tolerance, and a risk threshold. You need to understand those as well. Companies have to take risks. This is given. If you don't take risks, you won't make money but you can take too much, right? And have all sort of federal government reporting, for example, or you could collapse the company, right? So there's a balance in there that you need to understand. Um, one of the questions that is often asked when speaking to a sponsor the first time or an executive leader, when do you wanna hear bad news? You hate to bring up the topic, but it's going to happen. Uh, it's a difficult question to ask, and I wouldn't make it my first comment uh, when I meet them and I'm having a conversation, but it's necessarily to clearly establish the parameters surrounding a crisis situation, right? I've been around enough senior leaders to know that the one thing they like least are surprises, 
do not ever surprise your boss. And worse yet, finding out about some about whatever the issue is from someone else, that's catastrophic to your career, right? So you want to make sure they find out from you. So that's a little bit about managing stakeholders. Now, one, one sta uh, often stakeholder management, it relies on just a simple list of key players, right? When that list of key players is just a name, a set of names, it's a list. We call it a risk register because it's much more than a list. It'll have that stakeholder's needs based on your work department. It'll have their interests. It'll have their expectations. Maybe how they define success. It's much deeper and richer. So often the stakeholder management process is going to rely on starting with this list of key players, and then we can make it broader in intent and scope. And so we want to identify how this engagement is going to work, uh, and we want to convert this knowledge that we have of stakeholders into realistic plans, like uh, your change management plans. Some are going to care, some are not you will know now and have recorded it. And then once you've recorded things about stakeholders, like their interests, their expectations, success, how do they like to be updated on changes, etc., their views can change over time. So be cautious about that. <clears throat> be aware of that and update your risk register uh, periodically. So this is just a way of engaging people early on and then continuing that relationship with them, right? That we go back to R cubed again, roles, responsibilities, and uh, relationships, I think is uh, very important. Okay. R cubed. So um, project teams should be speaking uh, with all the stakeholders, and you as the manager that transforms should be leading that stakeholder engagement effort. You should be obtaining their viewpoints because their viewpoints matter in defining your success. You should be working with them to create a set of actions that you will take as a manager that transforms. And this is going to be informed by the true dynamics or functionality or engineering requirements of your project, as well as the stakeholder uh, needs and expectations. So we'll want to create a stakeholder map, right? And this stakeholder map can be kind of, a, it's a dynamic process. It'll change. It'll need to be updated over time. Uh, but it, it'll enable you to graphically present your stakeholders understand the political environment at which your organization operates, understand the relationships between the stakeholders. And so when I draw a map of stakeholders, I, I'm trying to understand the political structure, the official relationships and the unofficial relationships. Maybe the CEO plays golf with the finance officer, and though they're not that close in rank in the company, that's a lot of time that they can make input or suggestions. Uh, I want to uh, work work back from those who must who, who have to change, right? Who really are antagonistic towards my workspace. Or maybe focus on those who have the authority to make changes that I want to make right? And get them to partner with me. I want to identify these sort of stakeholder pressure points. Okay. Um, and I want to understand shortfalls in their commitment to my organization. Uh, maybe uh, do they have sufficient or inadequate influence? Uh, do they have a a, an abundance or a lack of institutional power? Do they have good communication or not? And so I want to 
uh, provide an opportunity uh, for multiple views as I build this analysis. And so predicting how potential recommendations from my organization may affect these other stakeholders and also being very clear on who should be involved in that decision-making process will all be modified based on my understanding of stakeholders and where they're at. And so, as I mentioned, this is dynamic. I would update this map uh, over time. People do evolve. And I would make sure I engage a wide set of uh, people for input or insight. So this is kind of how uh, you could map them. A good way to <clears throat> figure out how to place stakeholders. So everything we do is change driven in the modern world because we are managers that transform. So when undertaking any change, which is frankly everything we're working on, it's important to understand how much a key political stakeholder has in terms of power. And I can either then facilitate or hinder, uh, hinder that change, or they can facilitate or hinder that change based on their power. So once your team that you're managing understands the power of these stakeholders, the next step then is to understand how they feel about your organization. So now first we understand their power. Now how do they feel about your function, your mission in the organization? And so to achieve this, what managers can do is use this sort of influence and commitment matrix. So here's influence on the left. Here's the commitment to change. Or you could, you could modify influence and commitment. You could call it power and influence. You could call it influence and interest, right? Use any uh, variables you want to track your stakeholders, right? And so you can use this kind of matrix to identify those key stakeholders and then prioritize them for specific action planning as you mentor, as you engage, as you... Um, as you work with stakeholders uh, in a day-to-day -day process, okay? And, and because this, this sense of commitment, no matter what you have on either axis, right, on the x-axis or the y-axis, uh, it can be used to facilitate a discussion on how you're going to manage them or the things you want to talk about with them when you meet them. And uh, so you can do this for individuals. You could also do this for groups as well. So th there's a lot of capability in this chart. Um, uh, you can see that if somebody has high influence but low commitment, then they pretty much fall into this area. And I'm only going to kind of manage, uh, monitor them. But if somebody has high power and a high commitment to change, then I, these are people I want to manage. I, they're useful. They're going to be working for me, in essence, even if they don't directly. So some, some approaches give labels to these four quadrants, right? And if you go online, you can find the labels for these four quadrants. I, that can be useful. Um, I, I tend to avoid using labels, so I didn't put them here. I want to give you a sense of what's going on. But there are labels you can find online if you type in uh, stakeholder matrix, right? Um, we want to make sure once we've plotted stakeholders that we keep this a secret, right? It can be very disrespectful to some stakeholders. They don't like to be labeled, and it can have a negative impact. So once you fill this in, Quit showing it to the team regularly. Keep it close hold. People don't like to be assessed, but it's part of your role as a manager that transforms for the good of the company. You need to know who to leverage when uh, to maximize your function. Okay, that's it for part one. We're going to come back for some more in a minute.